were unmuted and in this nice little yellow box. Um, also, if you have any questions for our authors tonight, please type them in the chat and uh, Rachel and I will uh, then save them up and um, pose them at the end when we get to the Q&A. So without further ado, let me hand things over to Rachel. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight and for your incredible ongoing support through this uh, crazy year in the world of independent bookselling. We couldn't be here without your help and support. So thank you for that. Um, tonight's event is one that I've really been looking forward to for quite a while. It's truly an honor to have Kate, to welcome Caitlin Greenidge to Northshire Live this evening. Her debut novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, was one of the New York Times Critics' top 10 books of 2016 and a finalist for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. She's with us tonight to talk about her new book, Liberty, which is an indie next selection, Northshire pick, staff pick several times over, and a book that I personally adored. She'll be interviewed tonight by Kiesi Lehman. I was fortunate to host Kiesi at Northshire's Saratoga store for an event for his Carnegie Medal winning memoir, Heavy, back in, on his paperback tour in 2019, one of the truly memorable nights that we've had in the bookstore. He's also the author of the essay collection, How to Slowly Kill Yourself and Others in America, and his novel Long Division will be released on June 1st and is currently available for pre-order. Please join me in welcoming them both to Northshire Live. And Caitlin, why don't you kick us off with a short reading from the book? Thank you so much. I'm gonna read from um, the opening paragraphs and then we'll just get right into conversation. I saw my mother raise a man from the dead. It still didn't help him much, my love, she told me, but I saw her do it all the same. That's how I knew she was magic. The time I saw mama raise a man from the dead, it was close to dusk. Mama and her nurse Lenore were in her office. Mama with her little greasy glasses on the tip of her nose balancing the books and Lenore banking the fire. That was the rule in mama's office. The fire was kept burning from dawn till after dinner and we never let it go out completely. Even on the hottest days when my linen collar stuck to the back of my neck and the belly of Lenore's apron was stained with sweat a mess of logs and twigs was lit up down there waiting. When the dead man came, it was spring. I was playing on the stoop. I'd broken a stick off the mulberry bush so young it had resisted the pull of my fist. I'd had to work for it. Once I'd wrenched it off, I stripped the bark and rubbed the wet wood underneath on the flagstone, pressing the green into rock. And I'll stop there. Hey. Oh. Hey. <laughs> I'm so, so happy to be here with you. Uh, I don't even know if you remember, but you remember when, when you and Bill came up to Poughkeepsie to talk to me? At of Bachelor? course. Yeah, of course. Okay, so so um, Caitlin and, and Bill Shane came to Bassett. I have no idea what year it was. It had to be between 2013 and 2015, sometime yeah. in there, um, yeah. uh, to talk about uh, this, this, this book I was trying to write or I had written or something um and it was it was like you know it was the first time that I've been in a conversation with somebody who didn't know me who took that work like super seriously um and at that time I I didn't know what you were going to create you know what I mean like but but I knew you were going to create some shit that was like something I've never seen before and I just want to start this conversation off talking to you about something I've talked to you about before which is ambition. And I want this conversation to sort of be, I want to talk about vision. I want to talk about thematics. I want to talk about the way love and, and, and knowingness is just effervescent in liberty. But I think, I also want to talk about like first sentences, but I want to talk first about ambition, Caitlin. And I wonder for you, do you step into these novelistic projects thinking, I want to be innovative and ambitious and or do you just happen to do things that require that sort of innovation and ambition? Um, I'm so glad you mentioned how we first met because I remember that day and Bill and I still talk about that day all the time. We're like, man, do you remember when Kiesa said this to us? Yes. Oh my God. Oh my God. Like we still talk about that conversation. Um, my friend Bill Chang, uh, who wrote a wonderful novel called Southern Cross the Dog that came out a few years ago. Um, he and I had sort of an ill-fated podcast attempt where, which really just <laughs> ended up being like interviewing writers who we loved and, and we both loved um, your your books so much and your writing so much, Casey. We were just so excited to talk to you. And I think, you know, I'm a I I like to have big ambitions for the fiction that I write. I I I what I love about novels and what I write I love about fiction writing in particular is that it is sort of a lim it feels to me as a writer like a limitless place of ambition. Um, you know, you aren't 
you like like you I you know I didn't know that at the time when 2014 I hadn't really written any nonfiction yet and I read your nonfiction actually to learn how to write some of it but um you know I think nonfiction has its own sort of parts of ambition but fiction is open to basically anyone anywhere I that's why I love the art form so much mm -hmm. um you know you can enter sort of any sort of POV you can talk from any um, position and as uh, as long as of course you do the work to figure out what that actually looks like on the page yes. but um the the sort of whole world and all of consciousness is open to you in a way that i think in an art form like um writing a script or writing a movie i think there's a little bit more um mm. a little bit more hampered and mm. also because you know we write these books and um because of the economies of novel writing you know the likelihood of a story with a young black girl telling it from 19th century point of view and she's not a slave so that's more likely to be a novel than it would ever be a tv show or a movie or a play or even a play um, because those things are collaborative things where you need a whole bunch of cash to come in and then it turns into producers and who's going to right. do whatever so that's what i love about fiction is that it really is a singular voice it's a singular artistic um, movement forward and so your ambitions can be as wide as that you don't have to worry about those other um, sort of questions that come up with other storytelling forms. And, and one of the things I love um, about Liberty and, and, and we love Charlie Freeman too, is um, I, I, I think there's a conventional way of thinking that things like ambition and soulfulness run counter. You know, mm. I think black folks, I think we know that's not true, but I just need to be reminded often that somehow like soulfulness is not the world of like pure naturalism, right? Like to get to ourselves, we need innovation. Um, and we need to push and we need to ask and attempt to explore big questions. And you do that. You know, when I first read this book, I wrote back to you and your people that it was a diasporic, a beautiful, beautiful, brilliant diasporic love song. But that's just like the beginning, right? It was so much more. And one of the things you say near the end of the novel is Liberty's writing to her mother and she writes, I know what toll forgiveness takes. I know that the world is too big to be knowable. And I just want to ask you to, I should wait to ask this shit like near the end, but I want to make sure we get it in now. Do you know, can you talk to us about what toll forgiveness takes post writing Liberty? And can you talk about the world and if it's too big to be know, knowable post Liberty? So this is a question really about like the discoverable moments for you post Liberty, but I want to use the, the, the language in Liberty to kind of explore that question. Yeah, I wanted to sort of, you know, I, I think a lot about particularly how we learn about um, the the moment of the Civil War and the moment of the end of slavery and um, how much of that mythology in our, in, in sort of like larger US mythology is the story of sort of like forgiveness, like yeah. in formerly enslaved black people forgave their enslavers or, um, you know, people who were veterans forgave sort of the horrors that they saw, or, um, you know, it's, it was a whole part of this country trying to make sense of what had just happened. Um, and of course there had to be dissenting voices at the time, you know, those, that's sort of the, the narrative that sort of comes up, but I always wonder about those people who were dissenters and, and, and the fact that forgiveness in that context required sort of a complete abandonment of um, support of, of any sort of, progress or, or um, black safe spaces and just sort of aban abandonment to uh, white vengeance and white violence. And that that was a part of our quote unquote forgiveness. And so that's sort of it on, on like a, in like a very specific historical context, but I think on, on you know, like a, a extrapolated context, how often when we talk about forgiveness, um, you know, in, implicit in that is a sort of, um, uh, uh, agreement that um we aren't going to address certain violences right so i i i wonder where i you know i i really wanted to play throughout the book in the language of um you know tony morrison talks about like parabolic language like those mm -hmm. words that we use so often and we think we have meaning the meanings of words like love or peace or forgiveness or freedom um, and as a writer, when you use those words, trying to um, set them in sentences so that a reader comes on them anew and has to rethink what those words actually mean. So 
that was what I was hoping would happen in sort of those passages. I tried to take those words that are we use so often that the sheen has just sort of like rubbed off of yes. them and rethink. Yes. And 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 you know, all throughout the book, you know, I'm 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 thinking about Liberty's relationship with love in her relationship with her mother, right? Mm -hmm. In her relationship with Brooklyn, in her relationship with Haiti, in the relationship with Emmanuel. Um, and what I, what I hear you doing in the book and saying now is that yes, we might use that word love as a proxy, but all of those relationships are using a different kind of energy, right? Like, so it's almost like it's not even fair to call that just love, mm -hmm. is it? Right, exactly. And they, they all mean different things. And, and the people within the relationships understand what's happening in, in completely right. different ways. Um, and yet, you know, our cultures have these sort of words that we try and use to encompass all of it. And I think that gets to that second, your second question a little bit earlier about like, what's the unknowable part of the world? That's the unknowable part. That's the part that is so wide. It's like we we are, we can only know our own minds. We can only understand our own consciousnesses and we can be speaking with someone who we feel a real connection with, feel like we are understanding with. And yet the words we're using could be, have completely different meanings to them. Um, and that's just like a part of being alive. That's a part of being a human and sort of our right. culture and, and the, the sort of pain and longing behind that um, is part of what Liberty is exploring in the, in the novel. Yeah, and, and, and Liberty is pulled by um, lots and lots of different forces, lots of different kinds of desire, um, lot, you know, from, from her mother, from the place. Um, and, and I just wonder if we can talk a bit about hate. I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but and I, I kind of know the answer to the question, but I think everybody needs to know. Can we talk about like why Haiti was so like foundationally, like there's no, like this can't be like, oh, maybe we can go somewhere else. Like, <laughs> like why, why is hate, why was Haiti so foundational to what you wanted to explore in this book? Yeah, I mean, you know, Haiti was a big part of Black America's imagination in the 19th and into the 20th century. You know, Zora Neale Hurston famously writes about Haiti and travels there. Um, you know, Haiti is the symbol of what is possible uh, with Black self-determination. And um, so it's really important that that's the country that, that um, uh, Liberty seeks sort of her own freedom in. Mm -hmm. And then also Haiti is, is um, not only because of its revolution, but because of its such close ties to our um, countries in Africa, because you know, once you start reading about the history and you realize that literally um, uh, much of Creole is based on like really specific dialects from really specific villages in specific parts, like the, like it's, it is the, it's the dream of undiluted, right? Like in America for black Americans, oftentimes there is this dream that there's this undiluted version of our culture that we could go back to somehow, um, that we could rediscover right. after being here in the US. And it's such a US understanding of stuff, you know, like if you talk to people who live in countries in West Africa, they're like, what are you talking about? We like, we're, we, we aren't like stuck here in Amber, just like waiting for you guys to come back. Like that's completely, you know, that's not how history works, but it's still, it's such a, um, it's such a persistent dream and longing. Um, and it makes sense why we have it, you know, um, because of the violences that we have experienced. It makes sense why we have it. But I, I wanted Liberty to really just be within and living within that dream that has sort of been around our cultures for so long. You know, like even it, it's there from the very beginning, you know, that, right. that, um, that dream. And, and I think it's hard to write um, about countries that are not like necessarily ours regardless. Mm -hmm. But but what you do is like you you're not making this a utopia like right you're like okay she goes expecting blah 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 and through Emmanuel like we see uh, an amazing subversion of what that expectation is which to me would be even harder to write about someplace but can we talk about in this culture now we're, we're sort of every so every few weeks people talk about who has the right to write such and such and such and such can mm -hmm. we talk about your um sort of confrontation with the question of whether or not you could or should write the Haiti portions of this book um, as someone who is not of Haiti. I'm not saying that, I'm saying that. How do no, you confront that? Yes. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, that was my big challenge to myself when I was um, starting to write the novel. I'm not Haitian. I don't speak French. I don't speak Creole. Um, <clears throat> my um, connection to the culture is, is mostly through reading at first. I hadn't been there yet when I started writing. Um, so for me, the sort of the way that I found my way in was realizing that I was writing from the point of view of a woman who was also not Haitian. She's not um, uh, Haitian herself. She is an outsider. She's going to get things wrong. She's going to misread things and to and to lean into that part of her ignorance and to um, uh, include as many sort of symbols as sig sig signals that I could to the reader, even though we're all we're constantly in Liberty's point of view, that perhaps her reading of a situation that she sees in Haiti is not totally what's right. going on or totally understanding stuff. Um, and that, um, you know, she meets a, a woman there, a Haitian woman there, um, the servant to her uh, husband's family, who very quickly lets her know that she doesn't understand everything that's around right. her, that she's not she's not a part of it um, as yeah. much as she would like to be. Um, so that was sort of my in and, and the way that I absolved myself to be able to write about it. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I just keep thinking about that line in there about like what's knowable, it comes near, to, well, a few pages from the end. And it, it just seems that the book is so interested, not in like knowledge as a finite point or place, but 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 knowledge almost as a as di knowledge as discovery and movement. Um, but I, and I, I don't want to talk about the crafts you use to get us through. I think this and you know you started by reading the first sentence of the piece, uh, which is um, I saw my mother raise a man from the dead, and then in your first uh, sentence and we love you, Charlie Freeman. The first sentence is the car doesn't feel like ours. I want to talk about propellant first sentences um, as for the beginnings of like lush ass shit we've never seen. Like how important, this is like some old craft shit, but I want to know the answer. How important are first sentences for you? Not first graphs, but first sentences. Um, they're super important to me. I always love when I read a novel and I go back and I read the first sentence and I realize that it's a it's telling me everything that I need to know about the narrative or everything that I need to know about these characters. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I love, even when it's a first sentence that is so, sort of quiet, when you go back and you realize sort of the psychological stuff going going on behind it. Yeah. Uh, so that's usually what I try and go for. And I, I try and go for uh, a sentence that can be read both as, you know, the character's um, point of view and interiority, and then like a, 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 a wider comment on what you're about to learn. So okay. the first sentence of, sentence of this is, I saw my mother raise a man from the dead. Um, it's totally investing in the idea of like Black's mama superpowers, right? Like yes. literally raise a man from the dead. And then you learn within the paragraph that that's not the case, that, that that's going to be sort of the central tension, this idea, this um, liberty investing her mother with powers she literally can't have because she's just one mm. person. And the novel's larger sort of um, questioning of what the definition of black motherhood is, if we get okay. sort of away from the super super mama myth and also sort of like the the terrible, awful, abusive myth, where where is the part where we are human beings in between and we start to figure out who who people actually are? And 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 in that letter, right? There's a letter in the end where she writes about um uh where she where she says that mom, mothers are God, right? Black mothers are, 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 are God. And, and it's one of those, it's one of those, things. I mean, there's so many times in this book where I just can't wait to teach it because I just think it's like a, a treatise almost on how like what the first person says and does is, is knowable to that first person, but the book knows so much more. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, the, like, and I think that's where we get that like dramatic irony often. But yeah. it has to be earned, right? Because Liberty says, like, she makes these proclamations. And because we've seen so much of what she does and feels and whatever, like, I want to believe everything. She, you know, I want to believe everything that she said. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to, I, can we just talk a bit about the crafting of Liberty? Because I think that's going to make us talk about um, Liberty's mother, Ben yeah. Daisy, and Emmanuel. Like, can we talk about, like, what it went into the crafting of Liberty and that time period? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Liberty is a voice that took a, a long time to figure out 
where I wanted her to be telling the story from. Um, and I think I knew from yeah. the start that I wanted it to be in the first person. And I wrote it in chronological order, which was really difficult for me because I very rarely write um, sort of like all the events in, in order coming through. Um, and I I decided to sort of, the, the point of view that Liberty is telling it is it's a really close retrospective. So she's clearly talking from a, a, a distant future about her past, but um, on the page, she the she as herself sort of only knows a little bit about what's around her. She's from the point of view of whatever age she is in the book, and it follows her from about age seven to um, her early twenties. Mm -hmm. um, so, I really just wanted to um, build that character into a character like her being able to be wrong. Of course, was really important. Um, her. Uh, starting to um, catalog sort of the world around her. I also wanted her, I, the challenge to me as well was to write a book that was gonna take place right before, during and after the civil war in the US for black characters. And they're, they weren't going to really encounter whiteness that much. There's sort of just one space where they do, but the rest of the time it's, it's all only black characters talking to each other and trying to figure out sort of what blackness means in this new space. Um, so I wanted to write a novel that took place in the 19th century where uh, white racialized violence, of course, was like a part of the air, but it wasn't the central conflict for these characters. That's not what they're running up against at all. Um, and I wanted to write it from the point of view of a, of a young girl. Uh, and um, I kept thinking sort of, of of how much young girls it's very heavy to say it today, <laughs> um, but how much young Black girls in particular are um, just really discarded and oftentimes not thought of at all, um, you know, really just either thought of as, as full-grown adults or um, somehow more powerful than they are while at the same time being completely disrespected and denigrated. And so knowing that, even knowing that the character of um, Liberty has a lot of privileges, her mother's a doctor, she's born free, she lives um, in relative comfort and ease, even knowing all those sort of privileges that she does have, knowing that she's still within this, embodies this person or this, or is within a body that is um, primarily overlooked and disrespected in the US, I, I wanted to sort of bring all that into one space. And, and and I'm really taken by, like, the desire to write a, 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 a novel that a lot of people are calling diasporic in 2021 that is at least immersed in the questions of freedom, mm -hmm. but, but not at all concerned with, like, the machinations of actual white characters. Mm -hmm. it was, let's talk about that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Because it, it, I love it. And it runs counter to a lot of our tradition, right? Like, in well, our tradition, like when we're when we're exploring freedom in so many different ways, I think people do it in so many different ways. But like white people and whitenesses machinations are there, and I think my white folks machinations are in this piece too, but yeah. not but not but not embodied in, in nearly the same way we see it in other in other sorts of narratives, like that might be interested in in in, in, in freedom as well. Can we talk about the the desire to to to, to necessarily explore freedom without the actual like like embodied white characters? that's often editors encourage us to create. Yeah, I wanted I wanted her to, and I wanted the characters to constantly be living different definitions of black freedom. So yeah. um, throughout the novel and, and Liberty meets people who she thinks are, are living incorrectly, um, but are clearly living their versions of black freedom. So at a certain point she goes to a college that's would now, you know, 200 years in the future will be a historically black college, but it's just being founded then. Um, and she meets a woman there who is the wife of a professor, but she herself doesn't know how to read. And Liberty sort of obviously like really judges her and is like, you know, this this dizzy broad, like what's she <laughs> doing here kind of thing. Um, and, and she realizes, you know, pretty quickly that that woman is living a version of a liberated life, even though she's um, sort of living here with her husband and he knows how to read and she doesn't and she's, you know, a laundress and he's a professor and they have this sort of strange um, relationship that this woman still has a, a measure of freedom and self-knowledge that Liberty herself doesn't have, even though she has these sort of other privileges. So mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of play with that idea of what um, 
freedoms could look like, you know, I think especially when you talk about uh, um, expressions of black freedom, respectability immediately enters into the conversation. Mm. And if we are embodying freedom in a way that is um, not respectable, then oftentimes it's assumed that that freedom is not really free or somehow is a degradation or um, you know, is, is something we shouldn't be doing. Um, which then of course sort of begs the question then like, are we really free if there's certain things that we're, we can't do <laughs> because it would make us look bad. And Liberty, because she's sort of part of this burgeoning talented, what would be in the next generation called the talented 10th because she's mm. part of that culture that's so invested in that narrative. Um, she's really sort of like close to those conversations and those ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I'm, I'm interested in, um, Ben Daisy, right? Ben Daisy is the, as a name, like it, it, it's so easy. I'm, I'm, I'm sure like uh, a few months from now, years from now, definitely decades, centuries now, people are going to be writing about your names, like the way you name characters. I, I, I have lots of, um, cool opinions about like the way you name characters. Can we talk about Ben Daisy? Yeah. To get us into a larger conversation about naming here. Yeah. Yeah, so Ben Daisy is a man, he's the man who um, Liberty sees her mother raised from the dead. He's a man who's escaping from slavery that her mother is helping on the Underground Railroad. He arrives in a coffin. um, And once he gets to freedom, he is sort of, you know, he's still traumatized. And so he doesn't really have a way to live in this new world that he is. And he's making a lot of mistakes. And Liberty and her mother both sort of have to contend with when you get to freedom, like if you, how do you handle that when you're coming from, you know, a place of intense trauma and intense violence? And, and if you are somehow, somehow mishandling it, then how does your community either support or not support you through that? Um, and so Ben Daisy, you know, I, his name came from a, I, it came from a really actually personal place. Um, you know, I was thinking a lot, I was trying to write an essay about um, some of my dad's family um, and my dad, where my, <laughs> My dad's family is from Barbados and they're from a really small part of their, they're from a very concentrated, I'll put it, part of the island. So there's a lot of cousin marriage going on. And so um, there's a tradition in his family that all the girls are born with six fingers. So people in my family have, I, I was, I'm like the only one who wasn't, um, which is wow. a thing. I was trying to write an essay about this thing of like not having a six finger and what does it mean? And I bring this up because my dad had this uncle hooky um, who I don't, I'm not even really sure what his real name is. I just know him as Uncle Hooky. I've always known him as that. And that's because he had a six finger. He never got his removed. And so his hand was like this. And so it wasn't until like, I was in my probably like late twenties that I put it together that that's why we called him Uncle Hooky. That wow. that's, that's why he has that name that, you know, all these kids in the family are just calling him Uncle Hooky. It's just a given that that's who he is and that's his identity. Um, and that we all know that backstory about him. No. Um, and what does that mean, right? Like, what does that mean about our family? What does that mean about like love that we're showing to this person? You know, the, the way that we name him and call him out and call him by his name within our own family, what does that mean? And what kind of, personhood are are we or are we not giving him as the people who are supposedly love him the most um so that really messed me up when I was thinking about that I was like whoa I don't even know (laughs) (laughs) but but it so speaks to like the way like you don't have to be in a creative writing class to use language to comically fucking deal with trauma right exactly my my, I have I have a a great aunt on my father's side and like for the long like when I went over there well, I don't remember when the first time I went, but her name was Thumbs, mm-hmm. and, you know, because she had two thumbs. Right. <laughs> it's like straight descriptive, you know what I mean? They'd be like, what thumbs? And like, nobody's going to look at her and be like, why do they call her Thumbs? You know what I'm saying? Because like, she has two thumbs. Um, But also because it's funny. And, I, and, and I'm interested in like the way humor or not, I, I think there's a between funny, comical, and humor. Mm-hmm. And because you're dealing with the first person narr- narrator in the 19th century, who is a Black woman, can you talk about like like your desire to reach into comical or humorous or funny spaces and places with this voice and why it might be super important for that subjectivity to do it? Yeah, I'm so glad that you picked up in the humor in the book because- um, That shit funny. No. It's <laughs> funny, it's funny to me. <laughs> I, 
I, um, you know, I worked for a long time in Black history sites. My sister is a Black history professor. This is her library behind me. These are not all of my books. <laughs> um, we went and, to school together. Yes, you guys went to school together. That's right. right. Um, and, uh, you know, she and I worked together in a Black history museum for a, a good, like, four or five years. And we would do this research while we were there. And we'd be like, this is so sh frightening. But then also there's just, like, these funny asides where you're like, our people are funny. I don't know how to say it. Like we just are. <laughs> it was like it just you just are. Like you know, uh, you know. I always point. Um, a few years ago, I was meeting my sister. Up, we hadn't seen each other in a while, and and she ran up to me, and you know, she's a huge history nerd, so she was like, "I just got the new biography of Alain Locke." And I'm like, okay, Carrie. And then she's like, did you know when his mother died, he loved her so much, he just had her like taxidermied and she just like be in the corner at parties, like Harlem Renaissance parties, just like hanging out. And she and I just started laughing wow. like so hard. You know, it's just stuff wow. like that is just so wow. fascinating to me. And and so I love that part of our of our histories, just sort of the 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 outlandish and sort of strange and just funny stuff and and how our humors work. And so I wanted to include that in the, in the book um, as well. Yeah. That was sort of a roundabout answer. No, that was a great answer to me. Yeah. Man. Like, and, and, and spatially, I'm, I'm interested in like the space, the um, character space between Liberty and like uh, Liberty's mother and Emmanuel. Like, and, and I know someone could argue that space is Liberty, but I'm just fascinated with both of those characters. And I wonder if you could talk without giving too much about what happened, like where those characters end, just about like why it was necessary for you to craft those characters the way you did. And if there was a point when you were like, all right, I have to make a decision that they're gonna be this way or this way. And you chose to take them a particular, um, another way. Can we talk about that? Yeah. Um, so like one of the things when I was, the, the novel is loosely based on the life of Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart. She was the first black female doctor in New York state. I did an oral history with one of her descendants and she told me this story about the doctor's daughter marrying into this family in Haiti um, and having this really awful marriage and the, and the mother and doctor sort of colluding about how to get her out of, out of Haiti. But that Haiti was always this beautiful place in their family's imagination, family's lore. This place that was both ba a bad space for marriage but that this woman for the rest of her life was like, I loved Haiti, it smelled wonderful. I, you know, she was very privileged when she lived there. She like lived in a giant mansion or whatever, but she was like, I loved it, it was great. It was it was great and wonderful, whatever. So I I took that story and I started to look at it and I, and I looked at those characters and I kept sort of thinking like, I, I want this mother daughter story, but there are certain beats that I want. I, there are certain beats that I want a reader to get that are familiar. And then there are certain places where I want it to swerve. And so, you know, so the beats that I wanted to get familiar to were these places where um, there's this tension between a mother wanting one thing for, for her child, you know, that's like a very familiar story and a child rebelling. Um, but I wanted sort of these other parts of the story to feel fresher. So like mm. the, the relationship that um, Liberty eventually forges with Emmanuel, this young man from Haiti, um, you know, in the historical account that was a, it was a bad marriage. But um, when I wrote it, I was like, I don't know that I want it to be on the surface, like a straight abusive 19th century husband abusing his wife, like mad woman, the attic type of thing. Like, I think that this is more interesting if these two characters um, clearly are attracted to each other, clearly have some sort of connection to each other, aren't sure yet whether that connection is purely sexual or whether it is something deeper and are in a in a space where they don't necessarily have the ways to um, build on that in any sort of way or to figure out how they're going to come together to each other. Um, when I was writing the love story part, I saw, did you ever see Cane River? Have you seen that yet? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I saw a, 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 a screening of Cane River when I was crafting the love story part and I just, I loved that movie so much and I loved how that movie ended. Um, if anyone if anyone in the audience hasn't seen it, it's a love story between a light-skinned man and a dark-skinned woman. They're both um, part of this Creole community in Louisiana. Um, 
there's like a, a land subplot thing, but it's mostly about like them falling in love and like riding horses around in rural Louisiana. Right. It's really <laughs> beautiful. Um, and so I I wanted it sort of to, I, that was a huge sort of opening eyes thing of, of how do you write sort of a love story between these two characters and it could end in an unexpected way. It could end in a way where these, the conflict is st clearly still there, but you are um, sort of, their relationship is at a unexpected point. Um, and so that's where I was sort of going with with those relationships. And 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 you make the decision to make her mother light complected, mm -hmm. and 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 I mean I mean and that I mean that decision I think that that decision like you know ushers the book forward and and makes and 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 gives subtext to so many things that actually happen on the textual level. But but did you know that immediately that she, that, the, that she was going to be light complected and and that that liberty was going to be darker complected? Yeah, I knew that right away because when I was doing um, the research, of course, I'm looking at the photographs of these two women and and both of them were very light skinned, very fair. And and in fact, their descendant, Ellen Holly, she's a famous actress. Her first soap opera job was she was playing a black woman passing as a white woman. So their whole family is um, very light skinned, and I was sort of struck by that part of it, of, of how much that was part of their um, sort of ability to to live the life that they lived. Right. Um, and then I, I finally got photographs of the family they married into and the the patriarch is um, my complexion basically is like, super yeah. so I was like, this is interesting. And this is like really interesting. Right. Because this is an unspoken part of their whole thing, their whole sort of yeah. like part of it. And I, as I was thinking more and more about it, you know, I was like, you know, it, it is, it's something to write about because I think um, it's weird, you know, people ask a lot about like the colorism thing, like it's color, like the colorism theme. And part of me is sort of like theme, like it's just, it's a part of our lives. Like it's, it's, right. <laughs> it's like, it's right. there. Like, I don't know, it's, it's even in the books where you don't think it's there, it's probably there. Oh, like, I don't know what else yeah. to tell you, but, um, but yeah, I wanted to sort of explore that particular dynamic of a of a lighter mother and a darker daughter, um, and and I also wanted to make it clear that um, that the value of skin color um, is unexpected within their family. So Liberty's mother thinks she's a pri she thinks she's the most beautiful person ever. Liberty's mother, right. thinks she's a prize, um, you know, really celebrates her. And I wanted to sort of get away from that sort of trope of like, yeah, you know, evil, evil light skin against dark skin, whatever. But and I think you, I mean, you know, and, and in doing that, you do this move. I want to encourage people to um, put your questions in the chat if you have them. You do this move with 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 her mother and you, with Liberty and with Emmanuel, where I think sometimes when when we're when we're not really sure of what we're doing, we 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 telegraph relationships breakups before we allow them to actually like be loving you know which mm -hmm. means that we as the reader can't ever feel the breakup because we weren't ever allowed to feel the actual love yeah um and you could have done that so easily with Emmanuel given where he ends up but like the fact that you didn't do that and then so when he turns like old oh, traditional ass race man <laughs> and, 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 and then when I'm like oh he been up you he been that you know it, it, and, and then we have to implicate ourselves in this way that was not heavy handed at all, but was like, like a complete like exploration of like internalized misogyny, uh, misogynoir, like all of that. And can you talk about like his character and why it was important for you to create a character who ultimately did not, you know, for all that talk of freedom that we see and feel and believe, he has no ability to understand why, how liberty as a black woman needs a different kind of freedom that he necessarily needs to imprison you know right yeah he was really tricky because the first couple drafts um my editor was like i i'm not seeing his appeal i don't get i don't get why <laughs> I watch you with him <laughs> yeah what's so great about a manual so that like really thank you that's a huge compliment because it took a lot of work to figure out how to get him to a place where he is you know uh uh he does seem to be offering something different and um you know, I kept sort of coming back to thinking, trying to think through his story as a, as a, and, and where he would sort of be coming from. And, and um, I based his story in part on, um, uh, I was reading sort of some of these fugitive slave narratives and sort of reading about, um, uh, actually, 
I can't remember which people it sort of came from, but whatever. I, I sort of was thinking about what it would take to emigrate at a young age to this new country and, right. and trying to build a sense of self, a fractured sense of self when you're sort of fractured across countries yeah. um, in this way. Um, and how seductive that would be to somebody like Liberty who, um, you know, feels feels part of herself is missing, but can't really even really name what that is. Right. And, um, you know, in many ways, it was really fun to write that character because I got to put in all of the most um, seductive arguments about Black nationalism that, you know, still <laughs> hold like a big, like a, probably a bigger part of my heart than I would admit, but like right. a good part of my heart is still there, you know, in ninth grade, like reading about, uh, you know, Black separatist communities and just being like, all right, let's do it. Like that, that is probably always going to be a part of my um, <laughs> imagination. And so it was really fun to just sort of let, let that part of him be and just really yeah. just wholeheartedly buy into that, um, mostly vibes a little critical thinking but mostly just vibes you know? vibe. <laughs> yeah. vibe. yo okay I mean, this, this shit this this is um this book fam like i it's definitely one of those i mean i i think 2021 2020 21 i mean like you know there are folks out there who've been writing up a storm for the last 20 years or so 15 30 whatever but this year just feels different you know what i mean like i feel like black writers particularly are writing these stories and writing these novels that are just like you, you mean you can tell when you're reading something that is going to become a convention in and of itself, um, and and I, 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 I and I'm saying that like that's the biggest compliment I can give a piece of art. I mean, I see you doing that. I see Robert Jones doing it with. I see I see you doing it with with this novel. I see Robert Jones doing it with the Prophets. I see Disha doing it with the short story. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm interested in whether or not you see yourself as part of any. This is a, this is a tough question. I would hate if somebody asked me this question. But like, do you see yourself as part of any sort of like? group, legion, squad, team, community? Like, how do you see our community influencing this particular book? I mean, it's influenced by all of y'all. Like, your, your, your words are in this book. Um, you know, um, Rachel Kazigansa's words are in this book. Like, it's influenced, I've, I've reading, the people who are writing right now has only made me a better writer and and enlarge my imagination and I wouldn't have gotten to the place of even being able to imagine liberty without reading everyone who's out right now reading you all so I just have to say thank you to you and to to people who are writing right now and and um I think I I think a lot about what feels different because you know if you study uh, the history of African American literature you know that like the famous waves you know like we have yeah. like renaissance and then the, the writing of the 60s and 70s and the, and then the writing of the late 80s 90s like there are these waves and and what to me feels different right now of course is really obviously it's the internet it's that we can continue yeah. to have these conversations past the time that editors or gatekeepers or or whatever say we're done with these <laughs> negro books like get these things out of here <laughs> bring us bring us back the great white hope of literature like that is a thing like you know you know they that's a thing um that is real that sort of cut those movements off because of the scramble to find you know the the great white voice of literature to come back and write the real american novel sort of yeah. over and over again that happens and i don't know this iteration that a uh, that publishing can get away with positioning people in exactly that way. Doesn't mean they're not gonna try, but I don't know that like that type of sort of slamming of the door shut that happened about every 10 or 15 years in the past yeah. can happen right now just because the reading audience is more sophisticated and the conversation can continue online in a way that it couldn't in the past. And right. that feels extremely generative to me and really exciting. Um, and I love that we are getting to places in conversation that feel even deeper than, you know, conversations that were happening even four or five years ago. Yeah. I can, I'm saying have, I'm have, I will say for myself, I'm having conversations on a deeper level now yeah. than I was even four or five years ago. Okay. Um, and it just feels like we are, um, you know, increasing in knowledge in a certain yeah. way. All right. We got some, we got some, we got some, we got some, uh, folks in here who want to hear from you, um, so we have, I'm gonna uh, 
Emily. A great one from Emily to start off. Yeah. yeah. Emily, 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 Emily put this in here 35 minutes ago. So let's, yeah, okay. let's, let's, let's let Emily, my, my bad for waiting so long. Um, from Alexis Cole's newsletter, I know that you were inspired to write this amazing novel from a primary source. I'm currently working on a novel that is primary source based. As you were writing, how did you balance historical fact with your characters' lives and experiences as you wrote, knowing, of course, that characters tend to take on lives of their own? Yeah, I I um, really came back and back to the idea of what was necessary for the characters themselves. So mm -hmm. I like to work when I'm working on a novel, I like to work from a like a structure graph, like a map, just like literally like these are the beats or the things that I know need to happen. And then these are the sort of overarching emotional shifts that right mm -hmm. now in this moment as I'm writing this down on a piece of paper, I think are going to happen. And so that really helps guide the research because it helps me figure out what particularly like what primary sources are going to work right away so like for Alexis Coe's newsletter I wrote about this um, memoir that I found called A Hairdresser's Guide to High Life which is amazing if you can find it it's it was written in the 1840s by this black woman who was a hairdresser to rich white people she traveled throughout the world she basically just like got up one morning and decided to leave her family because she just wanted to see what the rest of the world looked like that was it there no trauma involved she was just like I'm done, I wanna see. Um, and during her travels, she definitely encountered racism for sure. And she helped somebody escape from slavery and was almost killed for it. But she also is just like a really messy gossip. So like, <laughs> it's her being like, this woman had false teeth. This woman, you know, she was thought to be a society beauty, but it's just cause she had really good makeup and good lighting. This woman was a social climber and was like totally pimping her daughters out. Like, it's great. It's, it's a, it is a voice that, from the past that we don't often get to hear, which is a voice from a black woman sort of talking messy. She's super right. messy. Um, and, and that was a real freeing, even just knowing that that register exists or having an example of that register to work from was super liberating and super freeing to be yeah. able to get to some other places. Um, all right, I wanna, I wanna make sure we get all these questions. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's another one, I just, wanna, I just saw it that is sort of um, in that, vein which was what do you enjoy more the research or the writing or what is the part you enjoy or dread most about each from Shannon uh I love the writing because you get to just really be free and and um and invent and you're not sort of stuck by anything um uh you know writing has its tough days um and not gonna lie it is difficult but it is also, I think, you know, it's something that I fundamentally enjoy doing. Um, and so, you know, I, I haven't gotten, I haven't written a piece yet, I think, where it feels really mm. like heart wrenching to write. And I think that's probably more about my own like emotional maturity around writing than anything else. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's what I'll say rather. <clears throat> and then on first sentences, Cynthia asked, how many tries did it take to come up with an effective first sentence and first paragraph? So yeah, like how many? Do you a lot. Know? Yeah, I a, a lot. A lot. I rewrote. I probably spent the. You know, I I started writing the book in 2018, and I probably like um, in January of 2018, and I probably spent till October of 2018 just writing, rewriting, and rewriting the first 15 to 20 pages, and then writing the rest in just like a real burst of like you know, gotta get it done kind of thing. But um, yeah. yeah, it it took a lot. Um, and it took a lot of rethinking what, I, what, where the character's position was and what she was sort of thinking about the wider world. Yeah, and I think this is a, sort of a follow-up, which is, did you ever doubt yourself or experience feeling lost in the, in the creative process? If so, how did you continue to find yourself and find your way? Um, I think I doubted whether, yeah, I definitely doubted whether something was working. Um, it was difficult to figure out the, this particular voice because it is a voice from the past. So it's a lot to make sure it doesn't not sound too mannerly or, um, yes. sort of like just off-putting. Um, and so that was probably the biggest thing was like, is this going to read to an outside person the way that it's reading right now to my ear? Yeah, manners, right? Like you, you mean, because you, you, you need to find the manners, but you also don't want to be trapped by those manners, I, I, I suppose. Um, okay, yeah, and this is a question. Listening to you both talk about it, it seems to be an exploration of the question for so many Black folks, no matter what era we live in. This is from Kimberly. 
what does it mean to be free? I mean, do, do you think it's fair to say that it's one of the, it, one of the things this book is doing is exploring that question, further exploring that question? Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, 100 yeah. percent. It's what what does freedom look like and what does it mean when we take away ideas of domination? When we say freedom isn't about what you can get away with doing to someone who's less than you, then what is freedom? Yeah. And, and this is my last question, Halen. You know, you talk earlier about Morrison and 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 and, and Morrison really urging us to not smudge those words that we use that don't that, that we think mean everything that we have made not mean anything like love hate all that shit but but what do you say what do you what do you do with the word trauma mm-hmm. um as a fiction writer as an essayist like i'm i'm really been thinking about this in my own work and i felt like liberty helped me helped me move to a different place for this new project that i'm writing um what what do we like do we collectively mean the same thing when we say trauma and if not like what do you as a writer think of the idea and the word i think those are two different things the idea of trauma and the word can we talk about that for a second before we dip sure i saw you tweeting a few days ago about like are we all using the same meaning of trauma when we use that word um and i would say definitely not like i think okay. it's really clear that people are using it to mean drastically different things yeah and um you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask that question is for me, it's it's about a uh, time register. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that is I'm most interested in is, mm-hmm. is how trauma readjusts our relationship to linear time, I guess. And mm-hmm. for me, that's sort of like the signifying thing. I know it's coming out of nowhere, but for me, that's the signifying thing about trauma. Right. Um, you know, I think I saw somebody tweet a few days ago that like on a certain level for black people, 2021 is 2014, is 1994, is 1954, is 1924. You know, like we live in this these different sort of registers of time that I think speaks to how we experience Mm-hmm. um events and how we're able to um move or not move on from them um and to me that's sort of like the essence of of what i'm talking about when i talk about uh how people are embodying or living through trauma yeah. um fam you you just i'm just happy that i know you i mean you you doing it you doing it like i wish i could be doing it like this is a this is this is an incredible book, and and you know what? Most dope ass books don't have dope as covers. Great but this cover one does. Like y'all, if you haven't gotten Liberty, you mess you messing up your life. You need to get it for yourself, everybody you love. And it's definitely one of these books that we need to read collectively a few times, um, not just to get lost, but to also find our way in and out together. So if y'all haven't, please pick up Liberty. And thank you so much, Caitlin, for just thank you. This was beautiful. Us such a great night and thank you guys for hosting and thank you everyone for coming yes thank you both so much this has been really sensational and incredible evening you can order liberty at northshire.com and you can pre-order kiese's next book which is coming in june um thank you all so much for being here tonight um please come back to future northshire live events and caitlin and kiese thank you so much for your time with us as well as you thank you Bye.